Tommy, Tommy 23. <laughs> Tommy 23. Yes, mate. I'm, uh, yes. I'm speaking to you from the past. <laughs> How's things, <laughs> mate? <laughs> good, mate. How are you? Good, good. Got really well. I think it, we, we had a, we were speaking before the show, we've had um, six weeks off, I think, or, or thereabouts. Um, lots of changes to, to location, uh, content, um, different, different pieces of content that you and I have been consuming. Um, but, uh, really looking forward to just shooting the shit with this one. And, um, and, and also really excited for this year, mate, with, with the type of, uh, guests we've got lined up, um, you know, everywhere from movement coaches to psychedelic researchers, you know, all sorts of stuff. It's yeah, it's just can't wait to get stuck in. It's going to be great. And as always, you know, bringing different varying uh, interests uh, to the table, given our own backgrounds, it's, it's very exciting. I love learning from uh, you yourself individually, but also the, the guests that you want to bring onto the show is as we've mentioned in the past, they're, they're guests that I wouldn't intuitively want to bring, like think to bring on the show, but think have such incredible value in their own merit. And I, and I love it. So it's been really cool to have that. Yeah. Oh um, man, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, you know, for, for, for today's show, you know, one of the things we were thinking about doing, well, the only thing we're thinking about doing really was um, just, just easing back into 2023 by discussing like a singular piece of content, whether it be a book or a podcast, um, you know, or whatever that, that you and I consumed within the last six weeks um, that, uh, that we both feel are probably just really worth discussing and talking about. And, you know, you and I both agree that talking is one of the best ways to, to learn, you know? Um, so yeah. Did you want to kick us off, mate? I'm, I'm very intrigued. Uh, yeah, before I do, I'd love to know if there's, any, if there's anything in particular that, you know, you've focused on over the last six weeks in your own practice that has been unique uh, to anything that you've done previous to that? Yeah, yeah, mate. That's a great question um, because uh, I'll give an answer that um, would probably be quite distinct from um, what I normally do. You know, I just assume, I feel like I have this like evaluation, perceived evaluation of myself where people would think I've got always got my head in books and all that. And that's pretty much true. But I've been doing a lot of running lately and uh, I've, I haven't been running in like 10 years. You know, I haven't probably since I stopped playing um, high level footy, but uh, I've been absolutely loving it. It's just so freeing. I just can't get over how I've been running. Um, I tried to use my running as like a, as a benchmark to how healthy my knee would be because my knee, my knee's always giving me lots of trouble. I've had two operations on it and it's kind of like chronically swollen, chronically just, um, you know, yeah. quite, just chronically doesn't like me basically because there's, there's yeah. significantly less cartilage in there now. Um, but I spoke to a physio, um, cause my body's kind of in tatters at the moment. I've, um, ruptured my pec. I still need oh, to get it. No. Yeah. Pretty badly. Uh, I'm, I, I need to get a um, an MRI on it because the the it, it looks like it still hasn't attached reattached, um, which means that you know probably the fibers just can't quite contact one another to to start to heal. So hopefully it doesn't require an operation or oper an operation, but you know there's every chance that it might. But yeah, because I haven't been able to use my upper body really, um, I've been falling in love with running again and and doing a lot more hip flex training, which is actually something I was going to ask you about because I've never done hip flexor specific strength training, but that has completely wow. changed how my knee feels doing a lot more like weighted, um, you know, um, slow and controlled knee lifts, things like that. Um, right. It means that my hip flexor doesn't get fatigued and then all the yep. pressure starts to move into my TFL, which aggravates my IT band, you know, None of that happens anymore, but mate, running is just incredible. And I was doing a, a half an hour run, um, uh, a couple of nights ago and with everything changing in our lives, you know, it was the first time where I actually felt like actually just calm. It was, we're in the middle of the country right now. I had about two minutes where I was just, it, my mind was dead silent. It was like, I'd fallen up, fall in love with the universe momentarily. So mate, that that's me. It's just been absolutely wonderful to run again, you know. <laughs> well, that's amazing, dude. And uh, 
running is one of those things that I feel like everything needs to be kind of humming in your body for you to sustain a regular running practice. There mm. needs to be a bit, there needs to be a little bit of self care. And for me, myself, I've picked up running again as well. And oh, sure. right, it's an, it's an incredible meditation. And to bring it full circle with um, what we're actually talking about on this podcast episode in being um, uh, books, there's an excellent book by my favorite author. And I think I may have mentioned it in another episode by uh, an author by the name of Haruki Murakami. Mm. And he has a book. He's a marathon runner as well as a, an author. He's like the, he's the coolest guy ever. <laughs> um, uh, and he has a book called What I Think About When I Think About Running or What I Talk About When I Talk mm-hmm. About Running. Something like anyway, it's, um, it's a great little internal kind of journey of, how he feels about running mm. and he's such a skilled artist in in the sense of being an author that he really articulates it in in, in incredible ways so right. you being uh, an amazing author yourself you'd get a incredible value out of uh, his you know his words mm. especially coupled with what you're pursuing right now so that's worth a bit of gander i've got well I'll, uh, let me let me bring that question to you so so what what got you back into running and then what do you actually, I won't go meta. Like it sounds like Murakami's gone meta. Um, what got you back into running and then plain and simply, what do you think about when you run? Uh-huh. Um, I got back into running because I actually, um, I've stopped my, my gym membership mm. and, uh, being it's, it's nice weather outside. Mm. I was just enjoying uh, being on my own, not being around people when I was yeah. training, just training in my, my own backyard. Mm. I have a school, I have a couple of dumbbells. I have some pull-up bars. I have this like, little matrix for my, for my kids out here. And I just use that. Perfect. Um, and then uh, where I may have gone swimming at the gym or something like that, I just go for runs. And yeah. To, and, and I love it because it's a meditative state. Mm. Sometimes I'll listen to something when I'm running. Sometimes I'll just be, mm. but uh, more often than not, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to something. And I just, it's more the feeling that I get um, after I run uh, that, that I just have an incredible uh, sense of, I don't know. It's like an, it, it's, it's like this innate it's freedom or something, isn't it? It's freedom. It's like like a human innate uh, perspective yeah. that yeah. I tap into. Yeah, and it's something that I can really um, uh, kind of explain with words. But mm. uh, um, what I've been uh, doing uh, over the last six weeks, apart from running, is um, I've been tapping into. Just give me one second. We'll just yep. pause and get back. All right. Just pause for a sec. So that's basically my life story. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the, the last six months, uh, six months, the last six weeks for me, really been focused around like reclaiming my creative spark. And I've been doing that through, well, before that I, I went and got my base set up and the idea was to really, really tap into my creativity through that particular instrument. And I still intend to do that. Mm. But what I actually did, was I set up my own pottery studio. Dude, and your Instagram? How long have you had your Instagram for? I've had it for a little while. But oh, yeah, like, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm generating a little bit more content on it and I'm trying to take people on my journey. Yes. Um, and that's kind of getting from a novice to being like a, an accomplished potter. Mm-hmm. And I understand it takes time. And it's really not about I am an accomplished artist. It's about what... I can, what, what journey I can take myself on yeah. and how I develop as a result from that. How do I learn? How do I, um, and, and, and the physical, uh, manifestation of my, my journey that comes. So a pot is a pot, right? Mm-hmm. But it's also just a representation of where I was at at that particular time. Yeah. And this brings me to the book that I've been reading as well uh, of recent times. And that's called The Creative Way mm. and it's by, uh, sorry, The Creative Act. Uh, and uh, that's by um, a, a music producer by the name of Rick Rubin, mm. who's 
for anyone that doesn't know who Rick Rubin is, he's probably one of the most seminal music producers of, you know, the last 40 years. Yeah. He's like a serious fucking dude. Well, you give know? us, give us a, a couple of examples of who he's worked with on, on some of the, cause some of the examples in the albums are insane. Yeah. So he, well, firstly, he's like, uh, th- this guy who, uh, grew up in New York and in the eighties, even possibly the late seventies, but let's call it the early, like early eighties. Uh, he came across, uh, this, this dude, uh, I think it was one of the guys from Run DNC mm. and he was just blown away by what this m- music was. Anyway, he bought hip hop to the masses and yes. it's like rap hip hop to the masses. It's probably not like a stretch to say that, right? Mm-hmm. So like first and foremost, that's wild to think what has come after him as a result of that. Uh, and, and to think also whether, they would have even been part of the music scene without it. Right. Um, but that's just uh, one one aspect of what he's been able to do. I mean, he uh, is responsible for uh, e- pretty much every Chili Peppers album, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers album from Blood Sugar Sex Magic, which is the best, the most, you know, for me, the most important album in my life. Mm. So... You know, to, to to think of it, uh, him like that. But then, you know, he's he's recorded with people like, and it just I'm just going to give you some some wild kind of artists, <laughs> and just you the juxta hear the juxtaposition of who they are and yeah. how they are so unrelated. Mm-hmm. So you've got got um, Pantera, wow, Dixie Chick, huh? Johnny Cash, um. Uh, I, I think Kanye, definitely Kanye, I think, mm-hmm. um, uh, so many others that, that are like are not coming to me right now, but like people like, you know, Same. pop, pop artists as well. The point is, is his creative process is not about, he, he doesn't allow his personal taste and nor is he a musician for that matter. Mm. Uh, he doesn't really allow his personal taste to come into the production process of bringing art out. Mm. It's about creating space and a holding space mm. for an artist to get the most out of himself. So I was explaining this to someone and he was like, eh, the, the person said to me, so he's really just a, a personal coach yeah. for the artists. And, and he really is because he has knowledge and, and obviously he has incredible knowledge to be able to produce such incredible seminal albums. But what he does is he's been able to um, intuitively develop these techniques that allows artists that are suffering from fatigue, that are suffering from imposter syndrome, that are um, uh, suffering from perfectionism to be able to put the shoe on the other foot or to take a step back and really understand the process to be able to get the most out of it. You know, um, if it's an, if it's an artist that, you know, needs to, um, uh, let, let's say only, uh, record vocals in a solitary environment, you'll get them in a, a room with complete strangers just to get them to experience it. And that doesn't need to produce a greater product. It's about, producing environments that challenge you. Mm. So something that you would never considered because you've been in a comfortable environment may come to the surface as a part of who you are. Wow. So this all kind of comes to the surface in, in this book uh, called uh, the creative act, a way of being. And it's so cool to see because he really has been able to articulate it in uh, like kind of a how to method and it's so beautifully written and it's so beautifully uh, delivered that it's really uh, given me um, a moment to pause, think and consider about what makes us innately human. And that's also yeah. come at a really, really, it's come at a, 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 a time where, you know, I just recently listened to this podcast with Joe Rogan and uh, Lex Friedman. I don't know if you've listened to that. Uh, that's a good one. Podcast. The most recent one? 
the most recent one about open AI and chat GPT AI. GPT. And, and it really got me thinking about, you know, let's say we do get to a point where our day-to-day function is completely replaced by AI. Mm-hmm. What makes us human? And, and, and Lex Freeman talks about this and Joe's like, oh, you're so naive, you know, like, you know, we're all fucked type of thing. Yes, uh, yes. And, but but I, I tend to agree with Lex in saying that what makes us uniquely uh, human, how can we develop this creative process within us? How can we dance within ourselves? How can create, we create something so beautifully unique, not just from individual to individual, but from an individual perspective from day to day? Because it can be so unpredictable. You know, right now AI is uh, almost like a predictable um, manifestation of uh, programming, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. And I'm sure they'll become a great deal more sophisticated as well. But I'm really fascinated with the creative process of what makes us innately human right now. Mm. And Rick Rubin, Circle, uh, in this discussion has beautifully articulated it and guided the readers to a process of ideas, strategies, and philosophies about how to do that. Uh, so much in that, man. So, all right. So let me ask you a question. So what, so if someone, so the old, the, the classic elevator pitch, right? So if someone said to you, oh, you know, um, what do you do? And you said, well, part, part of, part of the work that I do is in, is in coaching individuals. Um, obviously you have an avenue through physical health and well being, but one of the reasons why you and I connect is because there's a, a, a huge psychological and spiritual aspect to what you do as well, being a holistic coach, you know, um, you have your different avenues with working with dads and parents and corporates as well. But then someone says to you, okay, well, well what is it that you're trying to get out of the human being? What is it? What, what is it that makes us innately human as distinct from some of these AI technologies? Uh, uh, good question. I mean, for, for me, I asked myself, I've been asking my dad, myself that question a bit lately. Mm. And I think it's, like I said before, it's this innate creativity that can be expressed, not just as an individual person, right? I, like I, I could look at, you could talk, like so let's say someone just listened to this podcast and someone encapsulates a view of who Paul Glazer is and they say, well, he has a way, uh, you know, he is this type of creative. Right. But, but if we did this same podcast tomorrow, my answer or my description of the book that I just read would be completely different yep. because I've had a different experience of life yes. up until that point. And I find that I- incredible. And somewhere within what I just said there makes us uniquely human because mm. every moment on this earth that we breathe is completely unique. And not only do we have uh, a, a unique experience day-to-day, moment-to-moment, but we have the opportunity to create something completely unique, yeah. moment-to-moment. Uh, and I, I, I'm trying not to speak in tongue here, but it's quite hard. But, but, like, ultimately what makes us uniquely human, I believe, is this creative process that we're yes. express, and, and we don't even know what comes next. And, you know, maybe AI will be able to emulate that uh to a certain point but we have this ability to 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 feel um and and to tap into emotion and at at this point ai can't do that Mm, mm. well i mean it's it's you know one of the reasons why i love lex friedman so much I, i listen to a lot of his content is because he's a guy who's very kind of from the you know from 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 the superficial level, he seems to be very kind of left brain oriented, you know, MIT, PhD, interested in AI, robotics, technology. And yet he's got this wonderful capacity to explore the right hemisphere stuff. You know, he's a he's a true existentialist. You know, he's got a Russian background, I think, from memory. Um, yeah. you know, loves Tolstoy, loves Dostoevsky. Loves Bukowski. They were talking a lot about Charles Bukowski's writing um, because of the pain you can feel when you write, when you read his poetry. You know, I, I, I follow his Instagram. Um, I follow Instagram pages that put up a lot of Bukowski in writing, you know? Yeah. 
It's uh, Kate, Anthony Kate has quotes uh, Bukowski of Blood Sugar Sex Magic actually just as a which in which in which song? Oh, he he just he he quotes uh, his name. All right, says read up, pick up my book, and I read Bukowski. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but, and and why do people resonate with that? You know, because of the struggle. Um, and it's interesting because it, it's it's funny how you and I always work, man. I was going to talk about this today. <laughs> yeah, I'm loving this book. Is that back to front for you? Uh, no, it's bang on for me. It's bang on for you. Okay, yeah. So that book has been a really important read for me so far. I've I've actually been reading like a madman lady right lately as well. I've read these four books as well, which are all by a favorite Jungian analyst of mine called Robert Johnson, who actually trained in Switzerland under Jung. Um, so he's passed now, but just really important uh, books in my opinion about anal- analytical psychology. But 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 to your point. Well, let, let's say so he also sold his soul to the devil to play guitar. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, of course. You, do, you, do you know you know who Robert Johnson is, right? Robert Johnson. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is Robert A. Johnson. <laughs> oh, was it Robert A. Johnson? Is it wasn't Robert Johnson the um wasn't this the hang on, maybe I don't know who he is. Is this sort of locked up in the kind of the um John Lee Hooker music sort of thing? Oh, he's not he, he's like um I'd say eighteen hundred, maybe maybe. Oh right, he's like really early, maybe early twentieth century. But there's like a like a, a folklore that says he sold his uh, soul to the devil to become a like a like a jet a guitar. Yeah, and, and it was just like at the crossroads of like a, you know how like you, you can you can find the devil and sell you sell your soul, dude. I could be talking about my out of my ass here, but like there's this there's this often this like thing of like you get to a crossroads. Which is obviously like a, a giant metaphor, but that's where you find the devil, and you can go like the hard route, the heavenly way, or the the easy route, and sell your soul, and you'll get a magic power. But then you've lost your soul. Yeah, I think that's that, that's kind of the the way. Uh, uh, but I, I'm not sure where like the specifics of it. We'll have to look this like out. This <laughs> folk, folk, folklore that uh, uh, took place. So that's yeah, Robert Johnson. I know. Well, 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 check out. I mean, that's the only Robert Johnson we should know. From the sound, you know what? Let's make this whole show about Robert Johnson, <laughs> Robert Johnson, and the Devil. Robert Johnson, the Devil. <laughs> now, but to 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 bring it back to to more. to Rogan and Lex Friedman, I think because I think that was a really good podcast. Again, lovely little piece of um, synchronicity, you know, that you and I both happened to. There's a three hour show, man. That's not like a twenty minute podcast, you know. <laughs> no, <laughs> but there are so many deep ideas, I think. And I think Rogan's got this kind of real, obviously he says a lot of it tongue in cheek and there's a, cause he's a, com- he's a, a comedian, but this kind of like, they're going to take over the world. We're going to lose. He often, he often says that human beings are things that just create. Um, but he, he almost says it in like a reductionist way, you know? And I think it's so much deeper and more exciting and optimistic than, than yeah. one of the ways he gives gives it credit. You know, I've heard him say that a couple of times. Could be wrong. I'd love to, if we ever got the opportunity to speak with him, that'd be epic, you know, but yeah, there's a thing that there's a thing. Let, let me tell you what I started thinking about as I was listening to that podcast. Cause I think it would be a really important, um, uh, uh, discussion piece that you and I could just yarn on for a little bit here. Right. So there's a, there's a line, um, that is often, um, explored among philosophers and existentialists in one of Dostoevsky's works where he talks about this idea that, you know, what if we could get rid of suffering? Because the whole existentialist viewpoint is that you should live your life in spite of the suffering, except the suffering, because the suffering being an intrinsic aspect to life actually is the thing that creates the meaning. You know, Viktor Frankl, that was his whole thing, right? What we're trying to do in terms of growth, whether that be psychological growth or even on the macro economic growth is to relieve and ultimately eliminate as much suffering as we possibly can. But the existentialists say, well, hang on a second. You need that. The human being needs that suffering because we have evolved to become really good at challenge. We haven't actually evolved to become really good at living in the absence of challenge which is a really, really important point. And the Dostoevsky idea is, well, let's say we all 
just sat around and, and busied ourselves with a continuation of our species and ate, ate cake every day, you know, and, and his yeah. whole idea was we'd, we'd ruin that paradise. We'd break the whole thing down because we need, we need the challenge to sustain us. So it's kind of like this thing of like, what are we doing from an existentialist perspective? We get to heaven. There has to be something else, you know? Mm. So we need the suffering. So what do you, what, how does that open up your thinking? It's a, it's a full mind grenade because you're right. I feel like, even you know, I feel like like a lot of uh, people's goals are to end suffering, right? Uh, Even, you know, there are, there are tenants within religions and uh, uh, spiritual practices to do that. But it's a paradox of thought and, 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 and living to be able to consider that. Even if you consider the human body, I mean, consider where we are in comparison to where we were a hundred years ago. We are so comfortable that we don't need to struggle mm. to, uh, to live and survive in the human physical sense. And what, is that ha- what, what has happened as a result of that? Well, it's created this epidemic of obesity. So yeah. if we can draw a parallel between that and the human mind, which I don't think is too much of a stretch either, mm, no. because ultimately if you're not challenged, you're not going to adapt, you're not going to develop, and you're not going to grow, which yeah. means you're ultimately going to go backwards. And it's inherent within our survival mechanism. We talked about this in, Baha, uh, in the past. Our brains are not wired to be happy. They're, de- they're, they're wired to survive. Yeah. So if we have, paradoxically, if we don't have a reason to grow and to fight and to uh, develop and to adapt, we're going to create reasons to be unhappy, I would think. Yes. In fact, it's been proven over and over again, you know, like in this whole fight or flight uh, scenario that we find ourselves in, Mm. you know, back in the day we needed to be in that uh, sympathetic nervous system. Now we're just creating reasons to be into that sympathetic nervous system. But, but we can do it consciously. And I think that's where the, that's where the existentialists ultimately leave us, you know, especially the, the Russians, Nietzsche, that was their final point in that, isn't it a privilege to be able to choose your suffering? Given the fact that we need suffering for fulfillment and growth, yeah. isn't it yes. a privilege to be able to get to that place where you can decide what suffering that you uh, take on? So for, for most of human civilization, you know, look, this is if we, rem- this is if we remain a, uh, a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? A biological organism. If we, if we, yeah. which who knows if we will, if AI comes along, maybe maybe it can help us remove the need for suffering for personal fulfillment to ensue. Right. But if that can't occur, we need to say to ourselves, right, who we are from a biological perspective is a thing that needs suffering to grow. We have to have that for most of human civilization. The suffering was forced upon us, you know, slavery, famine, not knowing how to survive. You, You just, you have to live like that. But now, at least in the West, we get to a place where all, so much of that is taken care for. We need to invite the suffering into our lives in order for that fulfillment to take place. Now, give it, if that is a given, recognizing that it's a privilege to get to that place, but you still need to have some sort of suffering. So we get to the place where we're like, hey, food's taken care of, relationships are taken care of, I've got enough money in the bank, you know, so A, B, and C. But now I have to make sure that I'm still having challenge in my life. So long as you do that, you, you will find your way. But what I'm really noticing is that people are so nihilistic about what's going on in the world, tensions, geopolitical tensions, climate change, that people just feel like taking on any form of individual suffering just for some sort of selfish personal growth path is ultimately pointless because, you know, who knows when China's going to start bombing the U S who knows when Russia starts going, you know, fuck this, I'm off, you know, who knows when the next tsunami will hit, you know, this, this, I don't know if we, we live in a, a very interesting time and, uh, it's like a dress rehearsal, you know, like, yeah, you know, you, you, you're putting it, not only is it a dress rehearsal for what may occur on a global scale, um, from a suffering perspective, but it's also, kind of 
paving the way and showing that we benefit from short-term suffering, mm-hmm. like in, in measured fashion. I mean, yes. it has the benefit. We're from a really, really uh, privileged position to be able to engineer suffering to a to a certain degree, right? Like we, we do have that uh, that privilege. I mean, you know, you were talking about, or when you were talking earlier, it reminded me of like we live in such a unique time in the history of this world because let's take war for an example. Uh, example, up until the Second World War, the sole purpose of the war or, or, or of any type of conflict, battle and war was to kill and to kill as many of the enemies as we, we mm-hmm. possibly can. Mm-hmm. The moment the A-bomb was dropped, the whole paradigm just changed. Yeah. It was yeah. like, you could just imagine like, you know, Genghis Khan, everything before then, it was always about kill, kill, kill. Yeah. How many can, can we, can we divide and conquer? How many can we conquer? How many, you know, the, uh, uh, cities can we conquer all that kind of stuff, and then we just with 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 a sw- with the flick of a button, it's like it's no longer the game. That's yes. the, the goal. And, yeah. and and I feel like that's kind of translated to many aspects of our life, mm-hmm. right? the The rules have changed, and we're mm-hmm. really struggling internally to keep up with those rules because it's like it's millennia of like learning the rules of the game and now then now it's just like a it, it's just a switch that has been flicked yes yeah well, absolutely absolutely the rules are changing so quickly um for all different sorts of things you know there's a real nihilism creeping in with young adults about university because you know who who knows how many of these multiple one hundred thousand dollar degrees especially if you, especially in the u.s you know um where everything's kind of privatized, but, but even, even over here, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 grand plus, um, are going to be rendered obsolete within five, 10 years due to technological transformation and growth. You know I mean? And that, and that completely fucks with the entire system. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. You, you know, if people stop doing that, then the world as we see it, the education system is just like, it's fucked. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and people don't know what to do. And I, and I understand, I feel, I feel that, you know, I, I feel, so even in my degree, right. I, I feel this sense of frustration that makes me want to complete it, which gives me some sort of path in life, which I need to desperately hold on to, to keep my level of existential overwhelm at bay. Basically, yeah. if I can just put the shutters on and do this, mm-hmm. it keeps me, <laughs> uh, you know, safe so that I'm not like this all the time because I'm drowning in that sea of overwhelm if I do. Right. Yeah. So sure, this restricts me, but at the same time, it gives me some sort of routine to live for. And I then it's so important. I, I, I agree. That have blinkers in, 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 in the world that we live in today. Yeah. At least temporarily. Or at least temporarily. Yes. Yes. No, I, I agree. Because I, I, I struggle personally. If I don't have a strong focus, I'm like flipping and flopping all over the place. Yes. So I'll not just day to day, not week to week. Like I'll be like, this week I'm going to focus on this aspect of my business. Now this week, actually, I'm going to scrap that. Now I'm onto this. It's like... <laughs> Stick me the path, develop it till till it's fully matured. Yep. And then say, and you know what, Tom, if you realize at the end of your um, psychology degree, let's just say you don't want to be a psychologist after yes. this. The only way you will know whether you've gone through the entire degree, the only way you'll know fully whether you want to or don't want to be a psychologist after studying a degree is by studying the query. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Exactly and, right. And every experience you you you're you're developing is adding to who you are. Yes. I I, and, I and, couldn't agree more. And actually, the one last thing, just mm. to add to that, you're in a particular field where I feel like there are certain fields that you probably are less focused on requiring a, a university degree. Psychology is not one. No, no, abs- absolutely. You know, this is this is something that I uh, 
really try to tell people, uh, you know, who are interested in doing this kind of thing. You know, when you're trying to go with, go, try to get a job as a clinician, the first thing they look at is not the life experiences, the fact that you can speak 15 languages, the fact that you're best mates with Barack Obama and the Dalai Lama. It's if you have yeah. a degree, you know, and we can go into whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But at the end of the day, there is a, a tried and true centralized governing body within these fields. And if you don't have the requirements to get that registration and become a part of that team, um, you're, it, it's so hard to get a job. It, it is just so hard. And it's, and again, like I said, we can go into talking about whether that should be updated or not. I certainly think that um, the hierarchy is too much, you know, and I think there are people out there who just because they're not a psychologist um, are left behind when their skills are sensational and should be, should be, you know, well respected, but, but they're not because they don't have the letters at the end of their email signature, you know? Um, but it, 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 it's, it's one of those fields where it's just, you know, the, I, f I feel like they have to find some sort of objective standard so that people's asses can be covered if worse comes to worse and, and, and something really bad happens when they're treating a, a client, you know? Um, I agree. So I, I understand both sides. Um, and, and again, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to have your own business, well, let, it, let the market decide your worth. Go for that. Yeah. You know, because there are some people yeah. out there who have an amazing business who were social media um, therapists as my uh, former clinical director um, yeah. referred to them as. And they're killing it, you know, way better yeah. than other psychologists because they've just let the, the, the free market just dictate mm -hmm. their, their, their value. But if you don't want to do that, and this was the thing for me that I really had to make, one of the reasons why I love doing podcasts is with you is we never know where these, these, these shows are going to go. <laughs> but one of the reasons why I, I really um, decided to get back into the trenches um, with study was because um, I fell in love with research. Um, and I wasn't sure as to whether or not I'd, I'd want to pursue a, a career in academia. Um, but also the business side of a business was a struggle for me, you know? Okay. And, and I think for me, I really love talking with people and I really love exploring ideas. If, if this podcast becomes a giant success, um, go us, you know? And, but, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful supplement to, to, I think who I want to become, you know? And, um, and I think that's, that's better for the podcast because it, again, it shows this diversity in who you and I are and how we can actually benefit each other's lives because of that diversity. Yeah, I agree, man. I think, uh, you're spot on. And, you know, that's the little synopsis of, I suppose, what what we have been thinking, <laughs> slash observing, slash kind of reading and digesting over the last six weeks. And uh, we kind of vomited it all out. <laughs> Who knows what the hell we just said? <laughs> but you, know, you know what? Like, this is why we started this podcast, right? To have a yarn. Yeah. Um, crack open a coffee. That's it. Come, come on in, the couple. <laughs> <laughs> but for everyone listening, we, we probably won't go into it. <laughs> but there were, no, we won't. We won't talk about the, the specifics. But there was a blooper of of uh, of how we wanted that intro to go, and uh, we'll, we'll keep everyone guessing. I wish we can retrace that. I wish we can retrace that. That'll be like a a setting on your Zoom to see where they. If it's still there, exactly. I know, but uh, Paulie and I were in stitches nonetheless for about fifteen minutes. <laughs> but look, we maybe at one, maybe at one stage we'll re release. Uh, I'm sure we will. Exactly. What, I'm sure we will. I think once once we've reached escape velocity, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah we could auction that out. <laughs> exactly. Oh God. Now, but look, we, as you said, mate, we both love to talk. We love to um, discuss. We love to learn. We love to think. Um, one of the things I think that you and I both love to do as well, which we haven't really explored um, on the show yet, is we love to disagree. 
for the pursuit of ideas. You know, I think that that's one of the reasons why I, I, my, our friendship is so dear to me is we're often pushing back on, on each other's ideas and, and thoughts, you know? Um, and, and I'm sure that that's going to come into the, into the, to the show more as we start to talk about um, different things that you and I perhaps different, um, have different opinions on different ways of looking at it. Um, you know, I think more of that is healthier in this world, you know, um, because if you go into those conversations to learn, not to be right, um, you can't lose. You just cannot lose. It's the, uh, it, it, those conversations if, is what gives me hope in the human race in the future. Yeah. Because if individuals can develop to a point of evolution where they're not attached and protected by their position, mm. but are open to have a conversation and just to be like, oh, that's cool. I don't agree with that, but I want to learn about your position. What a world we, we would live in. You know? Yes. If you look at these, you know, like internet keyboard jockeys who are just bloody, you know. Blasting doing, people what, and. Blasting people and, and refuse to, and, and you know, we, let's not get into it because it's another whole yes. thing. Yes. Uh, you know, AI and algorithms supporting this in yes. everything that we, everything that we see, because we're not used to having conversations with people right. that disagree with. There's all we do is get information that reinforces our confirmation bias, yep. which is yep. a healthy situation to be in when it mm. comes time actually communicating with other humans. Yeah. Totally, man. We we could we could start a segment there, you know. Paulie and Tom disagree, you know, or or whatever it is. I think that'd be really fun, really wonderful. But uh, that's good. Yeah, that, yeah we yeah. could do something like that. Yeah, like once a month or yeah, something. Like, uh, let's call it. Tom is wrong. Yeah, let, let's do it. <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll sign up to that. <laughs> Tom is wrong and Paul is right. We'll just just make it like really aggressive and exaggerated. Let's call that really interesting discussion. Tom sucks. <laughs> Welcome back to the Tom Sucks episode, guys. Uh, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> um, all right, mate. Well, always a pleasure. We'll, let, we'll, let's get out of here. Get out of here. Um, we, uh, like we said in the very beginning, we've got um, a ton of really exciting um, guests to come up here. Um, you know, just off the top of the bat, we've got relationship experts. We've got parenting experts. We've got um, people who are doing really interesting um, research into horticulture. Um, we've just released our show with Menachem Wolf. Um, we, uh, we got a slew, so it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. And, we, we, and we're saying this because I think we're going to be pushing this f uh, episode forward to the beginning of 2023, Yep. which, you know, we're already a month in, but I reckon this will probably be our next episode to, uh, he head out because, if we don't, it'll be July by the time we do this and it'll be like, oh, welcome to 2023. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Guys, do you hear about that COVID thing? No, <laughs> 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 man, 9-11, what the hell? <laughs> oh, crazy shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, mate, all good. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, I'll talk to you soon. Guys, thank you so much for uh, listening to the show. We will talk to you soon.